Hi, my name is Martin Ackerman. I'm an advisory partner investment strategist with Citadel Wealth Management. And I'm here today at the USB Leadership Angle uh, presentations. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the, the global transition that we witness in the world. Uh, more specifically, what's happening in China, the impact that's got on all other countries trading with China, and also the, the transition here in our own country, uh, politically and economically. And hopefully from this presentation you will get a good idea in terms of how we see the world and also in this changing environment where we see great investment opportunities. Thank you. Now, if you haven't read this book yet, you might uh, start doing that. This is uh, The Intelli Intelligent Investor from Benjamin Graham. Um, so to give you a little bit of background if you don't know about this book, Benjamin Graham used to be the mentor for Warren Buffett, which is obviously one of the most successful investors today. Um, and this first copy was written back in the 1930s. Now, there's only one important quote to start with at the beginning of, of the book where they say that to, to be a successful investor, you don't need to be very clever or high IQ. What you actually need is a process to remove emotions from investment decisions. So this year started very, very different from other years. Uh, just quickly to demonstrate that emotion in a couple of slides. Oil dropped 25%, markets dropped about 11%, Chinese equity is 25%, European banks almost 30% down. And as a result of that, everyone is looking for a safe alternative. So gold rallied close to 20% and companies like Harmony in South Africa just year to date more than 200%. How weird is that? Because end of last year, the Fed started hiking interest rates, saying we think everything is okay. You know, the, the US economy at least is robust enough. How do you react then? Because a lot of that's emotion driven by investors that always run between fear and greed. So you need to get back to the underlying fundamentals to say, well, do we really think the world is heading for a recession? Part of what we need to do is to say, how do we break away from the trend and get back to the underlying fundamentals? We do that applying four principles. That's part of our investment DNA. That's how we think about the world. The first one is effective diversification. Now, that's an old rule, um, but it means basically making sure that you've got your wealth spread across regions, jurisdictions, asset classes. It's not just between different companies. The second one, financial planning and risk management. That is actually the most important pillar in terms of how we think about the world. Then uh, left bottom, value investing. Uh, we tend to be value sensitive investors, simply meaning that we don't, we're not always looking for the cheapest asset, because very often that can also be for a reason. So we very often look for a discount. And then the future is uncertain and will often surprise is very important because although I'm part of the uh, uh, survey where we try and predict the future, to be honest, we don't know. No one knows. Just a couple of numbers to put things into perspective. So the first number, $18 trillion. Any idea what that is? But that's the size of the US economy as we stand today. It's the biggest economy in the world. They only got about 330 million people. So not a, num uh, a lot of headcount, but a massive economy. 520 billion, depending on, on the day, but the market moves, is the market cap of this small company making these smartphones, Apple. 660 billion is the total market cap of all the shares on the JC. So you can either buy Apple or you can buy all the JC listed companies and you pretty much get the same financial market exposure. $350 billion is the size of the South African economy. That's our GDP in one calendar year, so that's the value of everything that we do. $320 billion, call it the same size as the South African economy, is the amount that the US consumer spent every year trying to lose weight. That's uh, just numbers in perspective. So my point is the U.S. consumer is important. The U.S. consumer drives the U.S. economy, but they also underpin the global economy. Quickly on Europe, I'm not going to say too much there. The ECB is fully committed to support Europe. They're making slow progress. Some of the structural issues in, in the southern countries is getting resolved. Unemployment is slowly improving. We don't expect them to shoot out the lights, but they probably will grow faster than 1%, which is just adding again to no global recession, at least for 2016. Right, China, like I've said, is going to be the swing factor this year. To show you how the world is changing, if you take your, your Apple phone, you will see that it's designed in California and it's made in China. 
If you take this uh, Bose speaker, then they say it's engineered in the USA and it's made in, because that speaker is made in Mexico. So a couple of years ago, if you picked up something like that, you will see made in Taiwan, made in Hong Kong, made in China, made in Mexico. So during the booming years in China, a lot of emerging markets didn't do their homework. They've just benefited from this massive tailwind, and we're one of those. We didn't put policy into place. So Brazil, Russia, South Africa, we're going to be the losers over the next couple of years. India, Mexico, Philippines, they've been proactive, putting policy in place, and they're likely to be the winners in this new world. Because we need to understand the old China and the new China. Now, unfortunately, at this point in time, the whole community globally is still focusing on old China. They don't see the new China. Volume terms, China is consuming more than ever. That's Shanghai, the biggest city in China 20 years ago. So to understand 10% growth for two decades, that's what that city looks like today. That explains an infrastructure boom and the commodities that they've demanded. What's important in this kind of environment is the consumer in all those buildings. Because they want Mont Blanc pens, Gucci handbags, they get wealthier. Wages in China is now growing at 16%. That's why they rather make these in Mexico. And as you get wealthier, you want to drink wine and you want to eat meat. So there's a massive, massive consumer economy and growth potential in China. Quickly, a couple of things on South Africa. Um, unfortunately, the rest of uh, well, the rest of the world seems to be fine right now for 2016. We don't think there will be a recession. If you look at emerging markets, because we're getting punished by the fear around China, Brazil is already in recession, Russia is in recession, and in fact, South Africa is also in recession. You can pick the number, whether it's 0.5 to 0.9, what the, the minister said in the budget, that's recession for South Africa. That's not enough to create jobs. That's not enough to help government to balance the budget. And it's an average of our two-speed economy. Because if you go to Mshlanga or Santon or CBD Cape Town, that part of the economy is growing at 4 or 5%. But then if you look at the latest GDP stats, agriculture is shrinking by 14%. Mining manufacturing is also in recession. Why is this? Yeah, we might say it's leadership, we might say it's policy. It's a lot of structural issues, but structural issues you address with the right policy over time. And policy is only determined by leadership. I've identified four of the major issues. Inequality, we've got the biggest inequality in the world. As a result of that, we understand why the second issue is prominent. Labour is not happy. If you ask foreigners why don't they open new factories in South Africa, they talk about corruption, concerns about electricity. Because that's the issue, FDI, foreign direct investment, for the past 10 years, we received the least amount of dollars relative to the size of our economy versus our peer group, which is the BRIC countries, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and you can add Nigeria to that as well. And as a result of that, it brings us to the last one. If you don't have a manufacturing base in your country, what do you do? You either buy this at Heathrow or you import it into South Africa. This is the Global Competitive Index, which uh, the OECD calculates every year. They look at 140 countries around the world. They look at a number of metrics. I just took South Africa's scores. I've ranked them where we're top, where we're not that great. Green, if you ask me, is the scorecard for private sector in South Africa. We, some of the best in the world. Red is, unfortunately, the scorecard of government or policy makers. We're the best in the world in terms of auditing standards. Our companies like Deloitte, Ernest & Young, PwC, KPMG. Our banks are top eight in the world. Number 140, cooperation between labor and employees. We're the worst in the world, according to this metric. And that's explaining why people don't want to open new shops, or why it's very difficult to do that. Quality of maths and science, the worst in the world. Quality of education, second worst in the world. You will do better sending your kids to Burundi, according to this metric. So there's some major challenges in the red. But fortunately, after the events in December, running up to the State of the Nation speech and the budget speech, green and red is starting to talk. So there is some things happening to take place, which is a positive. 
The decision that's been made on the 9th uh, of December last year cost the country dearly. There's a, a lot of ways of looking at it. What I'm showing here, we talk about the Van Royen moment, is the per capita GDP of South Africa just before the announcement. It was about $6,000. And then after the announcement, and that's as a result of the currency blowing out, it dropped to about 5400 So that's a real cost per person for that kind of decision. The red shows the actual Rand dollar exchange rate. The green shows the underlying fundamentals. We look at the current account deficit, commodity prices, the state of the global economy, the interest rate differential between us and the US. We can't measure political uncertainty, so there's nothing about that in the green line. Then the difference between the two gives you the, the, the blue line, and the blue line is very powerful because it tells you when the rand is totally oversold, like if you look in 2001, 2008, and again today. The rand is an emerging market currency, the interest rate differential between us and the US is about 5.5. So baked into the cake is a 5.5% depreciation every year. Unless structurally we can fix the economy, we can close that gap and our interest rate differential gets to quarter three, then you know, we're likely to see a slower depreciation. So on that basis, the rand eventually will get to 20 to the dollar or 30 to the dollar. But it's not in a straight line because some years, like last year, there's a lot of factors influencing it and it actually dropped by 25%. So it's a bit of an overreaction. So what we are saying right now is the, li the RAND is likely to end this year stronger, not weaker. Because we're likely to revert back to trend. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So last year, the 25% decline in the RAND was caused by two-thirds foreign factors. Nothing to do with the local economy. The strong dollar, because that's a cross that we reference it against. Fears about China and the impact on emerging markets. And the other third was in our local issues, especially during December. Right, so that's a bit on South Africa. Let's quickly talk about investment opportunities. This is what I've mentioned. That's a direct link between economic growth and company profitability. This is a, a trend over the past uh, 30 odd years in the world. But there you can see the evidence. If the global economy is growing less than 2%, companies cannot remain profitable. That's the danger for us, looking after other people's money to say, well, if you're heading into that environment, what do you do? How do you protect? We don't think we're there yet. So this is what we buy. So we think in terms of what we buy, there's still value on the table. We think the economy globally is okay. It's not that bad that you need to give your money to the Japanese government. This shows the P ratio, price earnings ratio, normalized over the past 30 years for different regions. In the US, we're now fully priced, so we understand why they're doing well. Earnings are doing well. They're not expensive yet. A couple of commentators will say they're expensive. Europe is offering good value, still a good discount there, uh, pricing in some of the issues. But look at Asia Pacific and emerging markets. They're the cheapest they've ever been. So Russia is a lot of state-owned oil companies, which is obviously taking a lot of pain now with the oil sitting at $35 uh, per barrel. And the P ratios of those companies are now four. So you need to be quite selective. So there's some areas it's pulling down valuations, but still you can go and buy a company like Samsung in Korea, which is actually a global leader, but they're listed in emerging markets and they benefit from that discount. And then if you look at the last one, South Africa, we fully priced. And the first question you need to ask yourself is, but why? Because fundamentally the South African story is challenging right now. The JC is becoming a two-speed uh, uh, equity market as well. We sit with a lot of global companies that's listed here for historical regions or whatever, but they make money elsewhere. So they decoupled from the local economy. So we're becoming an emerging market stock exchange of preference. So people enjoy trading in our stocks because we've got great liquidity. The currency is one of the most liquid traded in the world in terms of emerging markets. Easy in and out, well regulated. So we're a proxy for other emerging markets. So if you're a South African investor, from everything that I've shared with you today, I do still think that there's great opportunities as a world transition. Not only in this country, because we've got opportunity to buy some of these global companies. We've also got opportunities to invest in the companies that reinvest in our own country, because we need that seriously. But there's also great opportunities globally, where you can buy similar companies in faster growing regions at cheaper valuations.